Well, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly honoured by being asked to propose the uh, Edinburgh Sir Walter Scott Club's annual toast to the memory of Scott. And I thought the most appropriate way of uh, accepting the challenge, uh, where so many distinguished persons have been here before me, would be to deal with the aspect of Scott's work which I as a poet might be expected to have some kind of affinity for, and so I've called my address a, a new look at Scott's poetry. Uh, Walter Scott's poetry has never regained the wide esteem and popularity it had in his own lifetime, and the revived interest in his novels, which has been so notable a feature in recent years, has not been much extended to his poetry, as Dr. Forsyth has reminded us. The poetry has had its defenders, like uh, Thomas Crawford in his book on Scott, and uh, perhaps unexpectedly, Donald Davey in his British Academy essay, The Poetry of Sir Walter Scott, to take just these two examples. But in general, the tendency has been for writers on Scott to pass over the poems fairly quickly or apologetically. I think it would be generally agreed that he wrote a, a number of very good lyrics, uh, mostly embedded in the novels, and a handful of good ballads or imitation ballads, and it might be agreed also that the long narrative poems have uh, very good things in them and are not, from that point of view, entirely negligible. But uh, I think few critics would be prepared to say that the long narratives are wholly satisfactory poems. And often, um, a kind of uneasy distinction between poetry and verse seems to be the only way out when you're talking about Scott's poetry. Yet even as verse, they are uh, often not particularly well written and their verbal texture doesn't stand up well to close word-by-word -word analysis. Um, early reviewers, when the poems came out, were quick to point out how the lines were padded with unnecessary words and phrases simply for the sake of meter and rhyme. But these long poems, and especially The Lay of the Last Minstrel, 1805, uh, Marmion, 1808, and The Lady of the Lake in 1810, were the most widely read poems that had ever been published in English and their popularity was only exceeded by the even bigger uh, sales of Byron a few years later. So we have to ask ourselves, I think, uh, whether, like such narrative poems of Byron, as Child Harold's Pilgrimage, or The Corsair, or like James Macpherson's Ossian, Scott's narrative poems are as much a part of the history of taste as a uh, part of the history of poetry. The fact that narrative poetry has made something of a comeback in recent years one might instance uh, Derek Walcott's Amorous, a book-length poem in meter and rhyme, uh, published last year, a sort of um, Caribbean version of uh, Homer's Iliad, uh, makes the question one that is, uh, I think, worth uh, reopening. As Scott's poetry, as I'm sure you all know, including the long narratives, grew out of his early interest in ballad and folk song. The long poems are, in many ways, like extended ballads, epic ballads using ballad techniques of uh, abrupt moves in time and place, ritual repetitions, stylized question and answer, and an unashamed mingling of probable and highly improbable uh, events and elements. But even in the area of the, the ballad, despite Scott's great knowledge of it, and despite um, his being such an admired and diligent collector of ballads for his minstrelsy, minstrelsy of a Scottish border, even there, critical problems and doubts arise at every turn. His aim in his minstrelsy was uh, preservative and patriotic. In his introduction, he said, By such efforts, feeble as they are, I may contribute something to the history of my native country, the peculiar features of which, of whose manners and character are daily melting and dissolving into those of her sister and ally. And, trivial as may appear, such an offering to the manies of a kingdom once proud and independent, I hang it upon her altar with a mixture of feelings which I shall not attempt to describe. Well, in order to do this, Scott evidently felt that the ballads uh, should be given a final or best form. If there were different versions, he would uh, pick out and combine what he regarded as the artistically best lines or stanzas from each version. If something seemed to be missing or unclear, he would supply it or alter it himself. And if a ballad seemed to be, on the whole, rather bad, he might keep only a small fragment of it and rewrite it from beginning to end. The result is a bewildering variety of treatment from almost pure ballad to almost pure Scott. And in many cases, it's now very difficult, or even impossible, to say whether a particular poem is Scott's or not. 
things like um, Kinnamit Willie and Jimmy Telfer and Jock of Hazeldean and quite a few others. Well, this can be defended, of course, uh, by the, the good phrase we use nowadays of, of creative editing. And of course, <laughs> if the end result is a good poem, it remains a good poem, whoever wrote it. I was not denying that. But in the context of trying to come to terms with Scott himself as a poet, it's very much shifting sand country. And it's not helped by two other quite interesting factors, actually, at that time. First of all, that Scott was living in a great age of forgery and plagiarism. And like many of his friends, enjoyed deception and was himself deceived. And uh, secondly, that Scott, as a ballad collector, had none of the modern collector's interest in and concern for authenticity, since he believed, in his aristocratic way, that each ballad must have been originally created by a noble, bardic, individual poet. Uh, none of your das Volk dich it for Scott. And it was progressively ruined and destroyed by singers in oral transmission. So the whole ballad tradition, as he wrote in a book review in 89, was, quote, a sort of perverted alchemy which converts gold into lead. A view which would hardly recommend itself to Hamish Henson the School of Scottish Studies in this city, I'm afraid. Well, we feel more at home, probably, in defending Scott's lyrics, though many of these have, of course, ballad touches about them. But even here, there may be uh, a problem of interpretation. If a lyric comes from a, a, a novel, where it has a special meaning in its context and story. To separate the lyric out into, onto a page in an anthology of poetry, maybe to, well, there's something to it, it may be to deprive it, to, to do it violence, or perhaps to make it more mysterious in a way that was not intended. This is true of three of the, the, the best lyrics, uh, Proud Maisie from the Heart of Midlothian, Look Not Thou and Beauty's Charming from the Bride of Lammermoor, and Young Men Will Love Thee More Fair and More Fast from Waverley. And to take just a brief look at these, uh, starting in reverse order with the one from Waverley, chapter 14 of Waverley. Young men will love thee more fair and more fast, heard ye so merry the little birds sing. Old men's love the longest will last, and the throstle cock's head is under his wing. The young man's wrath is like light straw and fire, heard ye so merry the little birds sing. But like red hot steel is the old man's ire, and the throstle cock's head is under his wing. The young man will brawl at the evening board, heard ye so merry the little birds sing. But the old man will draw at the dawning the sword and the throstle cock's head is under his wing. The poem, if you come across it in an anthology of poetry, is a charming piece of folk wisdom, if you like, uh, contrasting the, the, the quick temper and quick promises of a young man with the more reliable and more determined behavior of an older and more experienced man. But of course, in the novel, uh, as a song, sung by the uh, so-called simpleton David Galatley to the young and naive Waverley, it's a shrewd and satirical thrust rather like the reminders of truth that the, sorry, that the, that the uh, fool gives to the king and King Lear. To the effect that while Waverley has been asleep in his bed, the old baron of Bradwardin has fought the young man's battle for him against the laird of Barmahwapel, and thus uh, shaming him and making him, as, as he confesses, uh, uh, greatly mortified. The simple song uh, underlines one episode in the long education of Edward Waverley. But in its context, it gains a humour and a, a bite that it can't have on a page by itself. In something of the same way, the very beautiful but strange lyric, Look Not Thou, on Beauty's Charming, perhaps the best of all Scott's short poems, uh, <gasps> gains an enormous resonance from its context in The Bride of Lammermoor, which is itself certainly one of the best of the novels. Like the last poem, it's not spoken but sung, and all the more effectively because it's sung by an unseen singer the young Lucy Ashton in her apartment in her first appearance in the book in chapter 3. Look not thou, and beauty is charming. Sit thou still when kings are arming. Taste not when the wine cup glistens. Speak not when the people listens. Stop thine ear against the singer. From the red gold keep thy finger. Vacant heart and hand and eye. Easy live and quiet die. Taken by itself, it seems a bizarre mixture of good and bad advice. Good to keep your greedy fingers off the red gold, bad to refuse to speak when the people are listening. And although sung by a woman, it appears to be addressed to a man who is being warned in a nolly me spirit not to be attracted by her beauty and not to listen to her song. 
But when we look at the actual context of the poem in the book, you have to transfer the main thrust of the words, even though they don't all fit, to Lucy herself and to her yielding, complacent, quiet character. The full and wonderful irony of the last line, easy live and quiet die, becoming apparent only at the very end of the, of the book, when Lucy has a most unquiet death in a welter of violence, blood and madness. Yet, even when the poem is read by itself in an anthology, the unquiet or violent subtext does seem to be at least potentially present, in the sense that the poet's uh, commands, or the poem's commands, if you like, if really looked at, would not necessarily lead to the easy life and quiet death of the final line. It is a subtle and disturbing poem in or out of context. Proud Maisie, from the heart of Midlothian, is this, the most anthologized of all the short poems, and one can see why, as it uh, clearly has uh, the ability to stand very well by itself as a miniature tragic ballad. But its context in chapter 40 of the novel adds another dimension, relating both to the crazed and uh, by this time dying Madge Walfar, who sings it, and to the wider issues of love and betrayal which the novel is concerned with. <coughs> Proud Maisie is in the wood, walking so early. Sweet Robin sits on the bush, singing so rarely. Tell me, thou bonny bird, when shall I marry me? When six broad gentlemen, <coughs> Kirkworth and carry ye. Who makes the bridal bed, buddy, say truly? The grey-headed sexton that delves the grave duly. The glowworm, all grave and stone, shall light thee steady. The owl from the steeple, sing, welcome, proud lady. In the novel, this is the last of four songs which Madge Welfare sings from her workhouse bed. One of them a harvest home song, one a hymn in the face of death, and the last two fragments of ballads of tragic love and betrayal of pride and fate. The characters in the story are greatly moved by the songs, as well they might be, since it is an affecting scene, crying out to be dramatised on stage or film. But the careful reader also notices what Scott himself does indeed point out, that Madge is not so mad as not to sing songs, all four of which have a special relevance to the effects of a novel, to the events of a novel, and there is much art in producing such an effect. Well, Scott then is clearly capable of writing some first-rate short poems, but what sort of aesthetic does he have for the long poems? How would he defend them, and can we defend them? How, how can we defend them, and how far can we defend them? Scott, like Byron, whom he greatly admired, often spoke of his own work with some deprecation, as if it was thrown off in the heat of the action of a man who was doing many other things in life. He wrote quickly, and often carelessly, though not always as carelessly as he sometimes said he did, though he does contradict himself on this at times, as the, as the mood takes him. He's many different statements about his own uh, working practices. He says at one stage in his journal, I am sensible that if there be anything good about my poetry, or prose either, it is a hurried frankness of composition, which pleases soldiers, sailors, and young people of bold and active disposition. Uh, and in a letter to, to Southey on the publication of uh, Marmion, he, he says, uh, commenting rather ruefully on the, the length of this poem, uh, I had not time to write the poem shorter. Very nice comment. And so he, he knew, in fact, that uh, a, a good poem probably had a lot of hard work put, put into it. But the main impression you do get is that Scott had discovered a way of pleasing a large public, and it's significant that he drifted away from poetry and developed his novels as soon as he uh, sensed that his popularity as a poet was beginning to decline after Byron uh, came on the scene. This attitude of desiring to please my own generation, as he uh, said in one of his letters, fits in with his uh, particular admiration for Burns and Byron, who were immediately popular poets, as against Wordsworth and Coleridge, who had, as Wordsworth said, to create the taste by which they were eventually to be enjoyed. The reactions of Wordsworth and Coleridge to Scott's poetry are very interesting. William and Dorothy Wordsworth uh, met Scott during their Scottish tour, 1803, when, when Scott was in the throes of writing the Lay of the Last Minstrel, and at Jedburgh they heard him reading from, from this poem. He, uh, as Lockhart recounts, he partly read and partly recited, sometimes in an enthusiastic style of chant, the first four, four cantos. And Wordsworth was greatly impressed by, by the actual reading, by the sort of dramatic effects, the entertainment, if you like, that Scott presented in his reading of the poem. But later, when he looked at Scott's poetry on the page, he, he, he changed his mind and became very sceptical indeed. 
and uh, reminiscing about Scott later in, in his life in 1844, Wordsworth uh, is reported as, uh, as saying, um, as a poet, Scott cannot live, for he has never in verse written anything addressed to the immortal part of man. And that, that, that was the end of Scott for, for Wordsworth. He could, just couldn't do that. As for Coleridge, Coleridge was never sympathetic. Uh, in a letter to Wordsworth in uh, October 1810, he, he wrote, I am reading Scott's Lady of the Lake, having had it on my table uh, week after week, till it cried shame to me for not opening it. But truly, as far as I can judge from the first 98 pages, my reluctance was not unprophetic. Merciful Apollo, what an easy pace dost thou jog on with thy unspurred yet unpinioned Pegasus. The movement of the poem is between a sleeping canter and a market woman's trot. But it is endless. I never seem to have made any way. In short, what I felt in Marmion, I feel still more in The Lady of the Lake, viz. that a man uh, accustomed to cast words in metre and familiar with descriptive poets and tourists must be troubled with a mental strangery if he could not lift his leg six times at six different corners and each time piss a canto. I should imagine that even Scott's warmest admirers must acknowledge and complain of the number of prosaic lines, prose in polysyllables, and he puts prose in polysyllables in, in, in capitals. Well, that was, that was Coleridge's uh, complaint that, that somehow it, it was really, really prose, uh, disguised as verse, uh, and that anyone who, was, who knew the country, like, like a he uses the word tourist, uh, even at that date, uh, any, anyone who, who knew the country in that kind of way would, would be able to do it. Well, how much of Scott can we uh, uh, rescue from these judgments? What does he remember uh, saying that he likes depth, likes spirituality? Coleridge complaining that his poetry is only versified prose. Is there any, anything these two critics missed? Anything which is genuinely there? Did they see what he was really doing in the long poem? I think everyone has to admit that these poems contain a great deal of uh, fustian, uh, totally uninspired hack work where the verse jogs along almost automatically from line to line. Uh, as, as Coleridge quite rightly said, uh, as a kind of uh, sleeping canter, one has to admit that. And we also have to admit that Scott very seldom uh, delivers the, the memorable phrase, the memorable line, which is memorable from a poetic point of view and not merely because of the sentiments it may contain. So what then is left? There is something that is left and it's concerned with something that's difficult to, to, to show or, or to, to, show, to, to prove briefly by quotation, but it's, it's concerned with large-scale, cumulative, dramatic, indeed cinematic effects, which you might perhaps manage to look at just briefly from two of the, two of the long poems. I said earlier that, that, that Scott used a, a great deal of ballad technique in the long poem, but he was also moving from the ballad towards the novel, and his long poems became increasingly like novels in verse as he developed them. The Lay of the Last Minstrel is very far from being a novel, but when you come to the complex and tighter form of Rugby in 1813 and The Lord of the Isles in 1815, uh, the first dealing with the Civil War in England, the second with uh, Bruce and Bannockburn, the awkwardness of the verse medium has become more apparent, and you can see that Scott would really be better writing in prose. And even the contemporary public felt that because these later poems uh, proved less popular. The peak of popularity came with The Lady of the Lake. But when he wrote the earlier Lay of the Last Minstrel, he was doing something that was original and, for all its faults, effective, and he was not writing a novel in disguise. The old minstrel who tells the story, who chants it, in fact, as Scott himself had done to the Wordsworths in Jedburgh, is supposed to be living towards the end of the 17th century, having survived what to him were the hard and dangerous times of the Commonwealth and Civil War, and the events he relates are supposed to have taken place a long time before in the borders at the middle of the 16th century and even involving with quite intentional anachronism the wizard or I think more likely early scientist Michael Scott who lived in the 13th century and all this remember uh, projected by Scott himself to a 19th century audience it's a, a many layered poem about Scotland about the Scottish experience or spirit with a great deal of nostalgia coming through the figure of the last minstrel. Um, and also, of course, through a suggested identification of Scott with him. He, too, is, if you like, the last minstrel of the old history of Scotland, which moves him so much. The story, uh, basically one of a typical border feud between the Buccleuse and Lord Cranston, uh, telling how the, the feud was eventually healed by the disguised intervention of uh, Cranston himself, 
fighting as the wounded Sir William Deloraine, the McClue champion, in single combat against Sir Richard Musgrave, the English champion, and ending with the marriage of Cranston to Lady McClue's daughter, Margaret. What is interesting is that the total effect of the poem is far from being as happy as that summary might suggest. It's a very somber poem, both from the presence of the old minstrel who comments at the ends of the various cantos and reminds us of time and change and mortality, and from the last pages themselves, which deal with penitence, penitence for disturbing the tomb of Michael Scott, the wizard, and with Scott's version of the Dies Irae, the hymn for the dead. The wedding celebrations are not even described. Uh, not of a bridal will I tell, says the minstrel. Instead, we leave the story with the dark tones of the day of wrath resounding in our ears, modified, I think, only, only slightly by a brief account of how the old minstrel was given a, a, a hut, a, a little cottage with a garden where he could end his days in peace. That day of wrath, that dreadful day, when heaven and earth shall pass away, what power shall be the sinner's stay? How shall he meet that dreadful day? When shriveling like a parched scroll, the flaming heavens together roll, when louder yet and yet more dread swells the high trump that wakes the dead. Oh, on that day, that wrathful day, when man to judgment wakes from clay, be thou the trembling sinner's stay, though heaven and earth shall pass away. Hushed is the harp, the minstrel gone, and did he wander forth alone, alone to indigent, in indigence and age, to linger out his pilgrimage? No, close beneath proud Newark's tower arose the minstrel's lowly bower. When throstles sung in Hairhead Shaw, and corn was green on Carter Haw, and flourished broad Black Andrew's oak, the aged harper's soul awoke. Then would he sing achievements high and circumstance of chivalry, till the rapt traveller would stay forgetful of the closing day, and noble youths the strain to hear forsook the hunting of the deer, and Yarrow, as he rolled along, bore burden to the minstrel's song. Actually, the most impressive things in the poem, taking it all the way through, uh, are those that deal with elegiac and patriotic feelings, not feelings of love and reconciliation and harmony. The sense of struggle and fight, of movement back and forward, is well conveyed through Scott's awareness that in a long poem, you can create dramatic effects by your transitions, by your cutting from scene to scene, even across cantos, as in the linkage between Canto 5 and Canto 6. This is difficult to illustrate in, in brief quotations, but I do just like to at least draw your attention to the, the passages following the, 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 the single combat scene, the single combat killing of Musgrave by uh, Cranston in Canto 5. There's a fine elegy by William of Deloraine uh, looking down on the body of his English enemy, Musgrave. Uh, an elegy which is strongly reminiscent if you've read medieval writings of uh, laments in Arthurian story. It goes in part, just to read, the, read a part of it. And Musgrave, could our fight be tried, and thou were now alive as I, no mortal man should us divide, till one or both of us did die. Yet rest thee, God, for well I know I ne'er shall find a nobler foe in all the northern counties here, whose word is snaffle, spur, and spear. Thou art the best to follow gear. T'was pleasure as we looked behind to see how thou the chase couldst wind, cheer the dark bloodhound on his way, and with a bugle rouse the fray. I'd give the lands of Deloraine, dark Musgrave, were alive again. The last wonderful two lines of uh, the real thing, Scott can just somehow, somehow reach at, at times, and often only be, be able to reach it after a long passage which, which builds, builds up towards a, that kind of cumulative effect at the end. That, that bit at the end when, the, when he says that I'd give the lands of Deloraine and remember he's talking not about his friend but about an enemy uh, uh, Dark Musgrave were alive again This close up shot if you like of a figure with bowed head looking down at an armoured corpse is followed very much as a filmmaker would, would do it by a crowd scene full of movement as the body of Musgrave is carried on his shield back home to Cumberland accompanied by knights, priests, horses, trilling pikes and bringing in sound as well as sight the wild strains of the minstrel's harp swelling and fading through the equally wild countryside. When the procession comes to a stop, the English ask the harper why he doesn't come and settle in Cumberland, where he would uh, be paid far more than he would ever get in, quote, uh, poor and uh, thankless Scotland. This taunt which angers the minstrel 
is intended as a bridge passage between uh, the transnational elegy of Deloraine for Musgrave, the Scottish-English elegy, and the famous pro-Scottish outburst which begins Canto VI, breathes there the man with soul so dead, and so on. Uh, the minstrel does not say that Caledonia is a great place to live in. Far from it. Caledonia is stern and wild. But because it is stern and wild, uh, it is, as he says, meat nurse for a poetic child. This high romantic view of the, of the poet as a child of wild nature is tempered, however, by the minstrel's stoic, um, downbeat uh, confession that Scotland, in the rush of its history, seems to have deserted him, leaving him nothing but its woods and streams, as he says, and thus I love thee better still, even in extremity of ill. The fact that these changes of mood, changes of scene, changes of focus take place over quite a number of pages shows that Scott had grasped the truth that a long poem may be served by an interrupted better than by a continuous narrative. And despite many cumbersome devices and uh, some blatant padding, his poem does keep moving forward in its own way, largely through his visualizing and dramatizing abilities. And these abilities can also be seen at work in The Lady of the Lake, which I'd like to say a little bit about finally. In this poem, set in central Scotland, uh, with King James V travelling about in disguise and uh, having a series of instructive adventures, the theme is the admired but doomed freebooting wildness of the Highland clansmen brought up against the increasing advancing law and order of the civilised state. The poem is kept dramatically interesting because it has two heroes, King James on the one hand, trying to do his best for the whole kingdom of Scotland, and on the other hand, Roderick Dhu, the Highland chieftain, a fierce and strong character who is eventually killed in fight by the king. The new values uh, survive, but the old values are looked back on by Scott with a typical longing and regret. Loch Catron is the lake of a title, and the poem is probably most famous for having started the Scottish tourist industry. Uh, hence you'll remember even Coleridge's early scornful remarks about it. In eight months it had sold 25,000 copies, it was translated into Mohawk in 1814. <laughs> the French writer Jules Verne set his novel uh, Black Diamonds in the Trossachs and included in it a poem called The Song of the Lakes. Sur vos bords on trouve la trace de ces héros tant regrettés, ces descendants de nobles races que notre Walter a chanté. La dame du lac vient sans doute, errer là sur son palafroi, et Diana Non loin, écoute, raisonnez le corps de Rob Roy. What was new, wh why the poem spread so, so rapidly in, in all sorts of directions? What was new about it, really, what was so fresh about it at the time, despite Coleridge's uh, remarks, was the presentation of the, the Highland scene uh, as compared with uh, relatively recent presentations of the Highlands, as, uh, um, for example, the, the grand but vague landscapes of McPherson's Ossian. Now everything was uh, mentioned by name and minutely described. There was a genuine topographical interest as well as the idea of the Highlands as a place of mysterious values which were being lost or were in danger. Description, therefore, had to feature quite strongly in this poem. And descriptive poetry is not on the whole highly thought of today. It seems too indulgent, too static. But Scott himself, with his dramatic instinct, seems to have sensed this. In Canto I, there is a first view of Loch Catron which is meant simply to establish its existence as a beautiful place, uh, a place of enchantment. It's described without movement as it appears in the setting sun, uh, one burnished sheet of living gold, as he says, with all its picturesque accompaniments of islands and mountains and trees and rocks. It's like the first statement of a theme which Scott is going to develop and make more lively later on. In the long passage in second canto, when the war galleys of Roderick Dhu are seen coming down the loch, the whole landscape springs into life and movement, with both sight and sound, in a most cinematic way, from long shot to close up. Uh, the boats are first described as distant specks, you can hardly see them at all. Then they become manned and mastered barges. Then you see their flags, then the spears and axes, the plaids and bonnets, then the muscles of the rowers, the flash of waves, and finally the streamers with their gaudy colours dancing from the chanters of the pipers. And at the same time, the piper's music, the pibroch, grows from a far-off indistinct hum hardly heard through light, lively sounds suggesting mustering clansmen into loud, almost shrieking tones descriptive of battle to a final burst of triumph followed by a long, low lament for the dead. 
Then there's a masterly touch when the pipes stop, a pause, while a faint echo rolls round the hills. And just as the echo dies, and you can imagine what a film director would, would, would make of this, it's replaced by voices as the hundred clansmen in the galleys start singing together with their hoarse voices the song Hail to the Chief, marked rhythmically by the splashing of the oars. Well, perhaps Canto II in that scene sums up the rituals of a way of life with its own barbaric beauty and order, as Scott presents it. But the very wildness yields to poignance at the end of the poem, in Canto VI, when Roderick and his society are seen to be uh, about to vanish from history, phased out by the progress of a uh, central metropolitan culture and the desire for national unity and security. The poem ends quietly, full of echoes and half-identified sounds, sounds of nature melting into imagined or remembered sounds of a minstrel's harp, a shepherd boy's pipe suggesting its only modern representative, while at the same time reminding us of classical pastoral and the whole mixture of the real and the unreal, though perhaps the unreal is real too, which poetry, even the poetry of Scott's imperfect art, always gives us. It ends, harp of the north, farewell, the hills grow dark, the purple peaks, on purple peaks, a deeper shade descending. In twilight, in, in twilight's copse, the glowworm lights her spark, the deer, half seen, out of the covert wending. Resume thy wizard elm, the fountain lending, and the wild breeze, thy wilder minstrelsy, thy numbers sweet with nature's vespers blending, with distant echo from the fold and lee, and herboy's evening pipe and hum of housing bee. Receding now, the dying numbers ring fainter and fainter down the rugged dell, and now the mountain breezes scarcely bring a wandering witch note of a distant spell, and now to silent all, enchantress, fare thee well. Ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you please to stand and drink to the memory of Sir Walter Scott. Oh, my God.